Today we are going to start the course proper. Yesterday's lecture, I've got to admit, probably a few people were, were bored um, because that you've seen vectors before. So yesterday's um, lecture was all about a little bit of revision, a little bit of revision. Today we're starting the, the, the proper material, the stuff that you will be assessed on. Now, yesterday we looked at, you know, vectors like, uh, for example, um, you know, the vector V1, 2, 3, okay? I guess we could call that a constant vector. All the, all the components are just constant, they're just numbers, right? Just constant um, um, uh, values. In this section, we're going to extend um, what we can do with vectors. We're going to define so-called vector-valued functions. So, for example, we might... We might look at a, a vector that has not just constants in its components, but functions, real valued functions. And there's an, there's, um, a, an example there. Notice it's a function, in this case, a function of one variable, t. And you, you can you know, make more complicated functions and introduce more variables and things like this. But we're going to start off very basic. And then we'll move on to the, the more challenging stuff. So we get, today we're going to motivate the subject and we're going to look at curves, vector functions, and parameterizations. Now, in, uh, in Math 1, 2, 3, 1, we've kind of done a little bit of this already. So some of this stuff today will look familiar, um, but you know, we, we, it, it's going to be set in a new context. Okay, so let's motivate the... Um, the study first. Why is this section important? How is it useful? What's the, the real um, aim of the section? That's an important question. You want, to know, you want to understand the reasons behind the subject matter that we're asking you to study. Okay, why is it interesting? How, how, how might you be able to use this? Well, vector calculus and vector valued functions basically um, can change not just in magnitude, but also in direction, because they're, they're vectors, right? Now, you compare that with the functions that you would have learned about at school, like x squared, you know, 2x plus 1. Those kind of functions can only change in one of two ways. Well, the function can increase, or it can decrease. That's it. So therefore, it's of limited flexibility in modeling and um, describing phenomena. Now, what we're going to try to do is build up, a, I guess, a mathematical framework from which to model um, phenomena in 2D and 3D. And vectors and vector-valued functions provide the perfect, the perfect I guess, um, toolkit to do this. And, it's, and it far, I mean, the flexibility of vectors and vector functions far exceed what um, the type of functions you would have seen at school or indeed last year. Um, so as a simple example, I've got this little diagram down here. Um, you can, you know, essentially in this, this diagram just gives you a, a, a picture of a planet orbiting the sun. And you've got this R is like a position vector of the planet relative to the center of mass of the sun. And you've also got this, ta this tangent vector. Think of it like as a derivative of the function r. Now, if a planet obeys Newton's laws, then you, know, you can use vectors to show that um, the orbit of the planet stays within this, the, this plane that goes through the center of mass of the sun and has a normal vector, c, um, produced by, by this, this um, cross product. Okay, so that's just that's just a little taste of, of what you can do with, with vectors and vector valued functions. If you don't if you don't understand that, that's okay. Don't worry about it. All right. So this is our main focus of curves in two dimensional space and three dimensional space. How to describe them? 
And um, you know, how do we describe them in particular using these vector functions? Now, I haven't really told you what a vector function is, a vector valued function. Here I've got an example of a cycloid. Um, this is something that uh, is taught in 1, 2, 3, 1 and 1, 1, 3, 1. You may have forgotten it, that's okay. I'm actually going to start with a simpler, a simpler um, curve. The unit circle. Now, in first year, you, you would have learned, okay, any point on that circle can be described in terms of that angle, which, we, which I'm going to represent by T. Sometimes it's omega. I'm just going to do it by T today. So the X component, can anyone um, refresh our memory? What would the X component of some sort of point on this curve be in terms of T? Anyone? Yeah, cosine t. Y equals sine t. So actually what you can do then, if this is if, if po the point P is just a point on the circle, you can parameterize, or you know, parameterize is just another word for describe. Okay? Describe any point on that circle in terms of the angle t. Now, as another um, example, the cycloid. Here T is a different measurement. T is, is the angle to the vertical. So essentially, you get a, a cycloid. You can, do a, you can form a cycloid. OK, that's your starting point, and you just roll it and you have a point on the edge of the circle which is your point P. Okay, so this, this circle's got radius A. The, the, the variable or the parameter T is the angle to the vertical. Okay, so you can see in that, at that position the, I guess the, um, the circle's done more than half a turn or half a rotation. Okay, so here are the parameterizations for any point on this curve. Now, the important thing here is to know that the coordinates, coordinates of the point, say, P, on the curve are in this format. Okay, now that's important. That's important. And I is an interval here. So here the interval would be, I don't know, T is in this interval here. Okay, now, so if we've also got a direction of motion as T increases. With this one, it would be sort of going around this way. So an um, anti-clockwise direction. Okay. Now, related, relating this back to vectors, we have the following diagram. Suppose, again, this is my point P on the curve, and say this is the origin. What I can do is form a position vector for any point P on the curve. Now, the, the point P is going to change depending on, on, on T. Let's say T's time or something. So, I can form what's known as a vector function just by formulating a position vector to any point on the curve. Now, that point's going to change, so our, our vector is going to be a function of time. Okay, so what we can do is denote this in the following way some sort of position vector that depends on time. Now one of the big advantages of using this or this sort of notation, this parametric um, uh, approach to curves, is that you can model curves that aren't functions. 
So you think about, oh, can't I express every curve as an equation like y equals f of x? No, not necessarily. So that's one of the big advantages of parametric curves. They can model things or describe curves that you know, y equals f of x may not be able to. So that's a huge advantage. All right, so let's say we're working in three-dimensional space now. Let's say a particle is moving through three-dimensional space along some sort of curve. That particle has a, you know, a, a, um, I guess the a coordinate at time t. If we use functions, little f, little g, little h, to describe the position or the coordinates of the particle, then these set of points form a curve that we call the, the path of the particle. Now I've got a picture in a minute. And the type of terminology we use, we say that these functions, f, g, and h, so f might be t squared, g might be t, and h might be cos t or something. Those functions parameterize or traces out the, the curve um, uh, of interest. Now, in particular, this is also important. The interval is important um, because you know you, you might only want a certain section of a curve, not the whole curve. So that, in that way, you would sort of play around with the um, interval. So let me give you a picture and hopefully give you some sort of better geometric understanding of what's going on. So imagine a particle is moving along this curve in three-dimensional space. And the, uh, uh, the point or the coordinates of the particle are given by this. I can form a position vector, OP, and form what's known as a vector function or a vector valued function. Okay, so the important thing is, as time varies, the, the particle will move around. You would expect the position vector to depend on time, and you can form what's known as a vector-valued function of one variable. The one, the one variable is t, time, in, let's say, in this case. So a vector-valued function of one variable. So we're going to explore um, what we can do with these kind of functions look at some of their properties and look at the curves associated with some special cases. All right, so the, um, oh, actually, actually, let me just summarize what I've said. So we formed the following. Vector valued function. Now, just like regular constant vectors, you don't have to use the IJK notation. You can just write it as, say, an ordered triple. So here's the IJK notation, and here it is as an ordered triple. This is written not a column. You could write it as a column if you want to. Well, whatever you're happy with, as long as you're consistent, you know, I'm happy with it. Okay? So here's some examples that I've just really um, sort of thrown together quickly to give you some examples of, of, of what some vector valued functions are. So here's some here. They're all vector valued functions of one variable t. Now anybody know what what would this represent sort of geometrically, this, this third one? Anyone? What, what, what might that represent? Circle, Circle right. And what would t represent in this case, like geometrically? And again, and the vector, right? That's it to the positive x-axis. Absolutely right. Well done. Okay. Um, the other ones are a little bit, you know. Oh, hang on. There should be a. Let me just cos t. Okay. How do you take the cosine of a of a vector? Whoops. What about the, the second one that I've adjusted? 
Anybody know what this might represent geometrically? Oh yeah, you're, you're feeling it. Yeah, some, yeah, a spiral or a coil. I guess in maths we call it a helix. Okay, excellent. Um, the first one, mm, I'm not so sure about that. I'd have to, have to think about that for a while. Um, I haven't prepared that one earlier. All right, so the, the, let, let, let's, we know what a vector valued function is. Let's actually move on and look at some of the graphs or the curves associated with vector valued functions. Now, can anybody suggest why, why might we be interested in, in the sort of the curves associated with these, with these functions, these vector valued functions? Anyone? Well, think back to high school when you did curve sketching. So for y equals f of x, right? If you could draw or sketch the graph of a function, you've almost got complete information about that function, complete information in a little graph. Graphs are really powerful and they can express a lot of information very simply. Okay? So that's one of the motivations for looking at the curves associated with, um, with these functions. All right, now it's important to, uh, to distinguish between real valued functions and vector valued functions. That's, that's sort of, you know, people go, oh yeah, yeah, vector valued functions. They're all functions, whatever. Don't underestimate it. It's probably one of the biggest hurdles that students who take courses like this face. They, they, they sort of get into about week six and they haven't, they still really don't understand the difference between a vector valued function and a scalar function or, or, a, or a real valued function. So the scalar functions are functions that you saw at school. Okay, y equals f of x. Vector valued functions are like the ones we're looking at today. They've got a, an output that is a vector. Okay, not just a real number. Okay, so let's look at these, um, one of the simplest curves in space. Lines. Now, you would have seen this in 1, 2, 3, 1 in the, in the algebra, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But if we want to describe a, a I guess, a parametric description of, of the curve, what you want is to form a vector, a position vector from the origin, that has, I guess, its head, or its arrow, just touching the curve. Okay, I've sort of drawn them down here because it's a bit crowded up here, but you, you, hopefully you get the idea. Can anyone suggest how we might be able to calculate or get a, a, a form for the, the vector OP? Here we know a point on the line, P0, and it looks like we have a vector V that's parallel to the line. Any, any idea? Anyone remember from last year? Well, yep. Yep. So, if we just use a so yeah, you're absolutely right. So, if I want to get OP, I can just use the triangle law, right, which says OP is equal to this vector plus this vector. Okay. Now, in this picture, it looks like this vector is the same as the vector v. Well, what happens if the point p was up here, or down here, or here? What you would have to do is take a scalar multiple of v. So you're stretching, or compressing, or reversing to get to the point along the line. Okay, so... Uh, So the T here is the parameters where we can stretch or compress the vector to get anywhere we want along the line, to, to any point on the line. Okay? So if I wanted to sort of write this in another way, suppose we have V, then I can just, just write it here. Now, the parameter T for the whole line, so the interval that we're interested in is, is just the whole real line. So can I have a show of hands? Who, who's, is that looking familiar? Can I have a show of hands? Who, who's that looking? Yeah, okay. All right, good. So that's probably the simplest um, curve.
curve in space line. So, the vector equation for a line. Now, this is a parametric equation. Think of R sub naught as the position vector for a point that the line goes through, and V is a vector parallel to the line. And T is just your parameter, your variable. Okay, now you can think of the line as the path travelled by a particle with initial position uh, naught and T representing time. Then you can just um, write out, out our equation by sort of, I guess, factoring out this um, uh, 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 magnitude of V. And this particular format gives you the position, uh, you should be able to see that the position of the particle at any time T is just the initial position plus the distance move time uh, b multiplied by the speed, okay? And in particular, the direction is in the, the straight line of motion. Okay, so here's one that I've created earlier. An example. Now, this is the stand... Uh, I guess they, they, they refer to this as the standard equation for the line. It's not written out as a vector. But you need to be comfortable with both, okay? I'm going to use vector notation because it, this is, of course, in vector calculus, okay? So this is, this is okay, but it's not the best. Personal view is that you should use vector notation here. We're here, they've just written out the components, x, y, and z. All right, so let's look at a simple example. Um, find the parametric equations through this point parallel to this vector here. Well, they've solved it using this approach. Let's write it in terms of... Um, vector form. And I can break that up just by taking out the following. So in this form, the line it goes through the point minus 204 and is parallel to the vector 24 minus 2. So we sort of get back the information that we were given uh, in the first place. Okay, so that's pretty, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that's pretty straightforward because it's nothing, it's really nothing new. If we wanted to, say, parameterize a line segment, can anyone suggest how we might do that? Suppose I don't want the whole line, I just want like a little segment of the line. Anybody suggest something? Yes. Right, that's it. Fool around with the, with the interval. So you don't want the interval minus infinity to infinity. You want some sort of you know, closed interval or, or I guess um, sub-interval of that. So that's the subject of um, an upcoming example, but this is just basically, um, we're not quite there yet. Here we're given a problem involving two points and you want to find the parametric equations for the line, but joining the two points. So first of all, calculate the vector between the two points, P and Q. So that gives you a vector that's parallel to the line, and you can choose either this point as the point that the line goes through, or this point. Now they've done it both ways here, depending on you know which which one you prefer. At this point, I should probably mention that there are many ways to parameterize a curve. Okay, you may come up with a parameterization, a description, and your mate sitting next to you may come up with a different different description using uh, vector functions. And you both could be... Two answers there on that slide are both correct, but they look kind of different, don't they? Okay, so there's more than one way of parameterizing curves. And here's another way, down, down here.
OK, well, that's a, bit, that's a bit strange. That sort of makes me feel a bit uneasy. Kind of, you've got all these different possibilities. Which one do I choose? Any, any, anyone want to comment on that? Which, 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 if you're faced with all these different parameterizations, which one should you choose? Which one would, would be um, a good choice? Probably the simplest one, right? I'm a pretty simple guy. I like to keep things simple. So I would choose the simplest one. Okay, I don't want to be marking exams where you've got all these exotic parameterizations that I have to go through and check. Now, why does this parameterize a line? Well, we'll find that out in a minute. All right, so parameterizing a line segment. Like you said, for this part, we don't want the whole line. We just want a little piece of the line, a line segment, right? So go through the same um, ritual and find out what t values satisfy the points, the sort of boundary points of your line, the endpoints, if you like. Now, sometimes it's customary to draw arrows when you've um, parameterized a curve. So you draw the curve, and what the arrows indicate is that if, you know, if there was a particle moving along that curve, the motion of the particle with inc as t increases or as time increases. Okay? Sort of just gives us a little bit more of a, a understanding of you know, potential motion and things like this. All right, so let's move away from lines. Let's look at some crazy curves. Yeah. These three curves have just been um, just animated, I guess, or uh, ge sorry, generated by a computer. You can see you can get, you know, really all sorts of strange curves that you could never get with y equals f of x. Some curves loop back on themselves, other curves spiral off to, you know, along the axes. In fact, you can use maple to plot um, a lot of these things too. Now, getting back to um, what you said before about the, heli the helices or the helix, here's a few um, vector functions and the corresponding curves associated with them. Okay, so you, you would probably expect that um, you know you would get upward motion as t increases. All right, so let's do a problem. Let's actually you know solve something um, that you might you know a basic problem that you might be tested on. So identify and sketch the curve in the plane parameterized by this vector function. Anybody know what it is? Parabola. How did you work that out? Right. Good. So remember, think about this as points on a curve, the position vector for a point x comma y on a curve. So what this really means is that x is just 4t and y is 32t squared. Oops. So what we can do now is just eliminate the t. What, we, what we're trying to find here is, say, the Cartesian um, uh, you know, y equals f of x description. So I can eliminate the t just as you, as you suggested and form a relationship between y and x. Eliminate t. So we take this and just substitute it into Okay, so if I sub that in, it's just... So I'm going to get some cancellation. I'll get 2x squared. 
So, as you, as you said, our curve is a parabola. So as t increases, which, which direction would we be going? What do you think? Up? Up here? Yeah? So that's a, that's a basic example, just substitution, uh, elimination really, um, and, and just forming some sort of basic, basic uh, equation. Now just as a, as a general side note, Let's say you're given a function of x, y equals f of x. How would you parameterize the curve associated with that function? Say y equals x squared. How would you write that as a vector valued function? It's easier than, than you think. Yeah. So what would the, what would the parameterization be? So your suggestion is, is let x equals t. So what would your, what would your vector valued function be then? Yeah. So t f of t or t i f of t j. So that's a good general rule to know. If you're given a function and, and you're asked to parameterize it as a vector valued function of one variable, all you've got to do is let x equal t and write the whole thing as a, as a vector t comma f of t. All right, so a little bit on um, some other curves. Here's a helix again, but with a little bit more structure this time. This particular helix is drawn in a way that you can see how it sort of fits within a, um, a cylinder. Okay, so it sort of goes around the, the cylinder. And let's say we're looking down the barrel of the z-axis. So the z-axis is coming out into the out from the screen. All right. The curve that we so, so we're looking down on the from the z-axis, the curve that we see would just be a circle. Okay, because you have no real sort of um, three-dimensional understanding there. So the, the angle is just to the OX, the positive OX axis. So hopefully you can see that this, so if I forget about that last bit, this will just parameterize the circle. And then if I want to step it up one dimension, bring out the axis, we're going to, as if t is positive, we're going to, you know, move up the z-axis. Okay. All right, sketch and identify the curve in the plane parameterized by this vector function. Now, there's two ways of doing this. There's a way of, that, that um, was just suggested where you eliminate the t or you can actually go straight to it. All right, so let x, well I guess I'm going to hedge my bets there. We either have it or we're going to let it be. x equals t y equals t plus so we eliminate t to get a basic line okay it's not that hard can anyone suggest another way of doing that problem maybe even a quicker way this is kind of the let's just grind through it way is there a slightly more enlightening way to do it
Yes. Oh, okay, all right. Sorry, when you put your hand up, I'm late. Okay, well, let me show you. All it is is rearranging the vector function. So if I just write it out like this, we get the vector parameterization for a line in two dimensions. Okay? It's got to go through the point 0, 2, and it's got to be parallel to the vector 1, 1. So that's two ways. So that's two ways of solving the problem. This one's pretty quick. I've got to say I like that one. All right. So what would our line look like? Something like that. Okay, pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's move on to another similar one. Identify the curve in space parameterized by this vector function. I'm just going to do this the quick way. So let's just play with the vector function itself. So that's pretty quick. Okay, it passes through this point and it's parallel to this vector. Alright, shouldn't be any problems with that, it's just playing with the actual vector function. Now, you know, I'll start, you might go, oh come on Chris, you've started with i, j's and k's, and then you've just gone to an order triple. To me that's okay. Okay, but you, you should use the notation that you feel comfortable with. Okay, pretty basic problem. Something slightly more challenging. Identify and sketch the curve parameterized by this vector function. Any ideas? Uh, not, not the JK plane. What, what, what would that ref The YZ plane, right. So if you cover this up, you'll get a circle lying in the YZ plane, exactly how you, and the T would geometrically just be the angle, right, from the vector to the, the positive OY axis, right? And then as T increases, you'll get a helix that stretches along the, um, po of T, the positive OX axis. So, So in the YZ plane, that's what we're going to get, some rotation. And then in three-dimensional space, we'll get something like this, okay? So what is it? It's a helix, or a, you can think of it as a spring or a coil, a helix wrapped around... the x-axis, I guess the positive or non-negative x-axis. But 
between the points x equals 0 and x equals pi. So up here, this is the view down the x-axis. Okay? So it's a slightly more challenging one. You may be looking at this and go, yeah, come on, this is easy. Well, you know, it's important that, I mean, my, my experience is that students think they understand curves much better than they do. Questions so far? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. Where does the radius of 1 come from? Let me, let, let, let me adjust my diagram. Yeah? Okay, well, if I just cover up that and I square, you know, uh, x squared plus y squared, right, I can use cos, cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. You with me? Good. That's a good question. Okay. Aha, uh -huh, now here comes a challenge. Parameterize in two ways. The curve, that is the top half of the, the, of the unit circle in the xy plane, with the particle moving along that curve in an anti-clockwise fashion. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. So this is what I want to do. And there's, say, there's my point P. Now, for this particular example, I'm going to let T be the usual angle. So here, I would have something like cosine t, sine t for t between 0 and pi. That's one parameterization. This is a challenge. Okay, we've seen that one many times in this lecture. Let's, let's keep it fresh. Let's be creative. Who can think of another parameterization? That's the standard one. That's the simplest one. Uh, so what would, the, what would the vector function be then? Now you're talking. Here is another parameterization. And what would the interval be? Because the interval is important now. Yes. So that is one parameterization. That is another parameterization. What's the difference between the two? Anyone know? You're on fire today, man, by the way. Anyone know? Well, the second parameterization will trace out the curve twice as fast as the first parameterization. So the part, I guess the, R, the vector function r sub 2 will sort of move along the curve at a twice as fast rate than r1. Okay, we don't, we're not really concerned with that, but see if you can understand why. The second part of this problem, that's anti-clockwise movement. How could we parameterize clockwise movement along the same curve. So we're just reversing, reversing the, the direction of motion now of the particle. This is a good, good problem. Yes? Yeah, so you're going to have to either, you're going to have to either change the interval, right? So instead of, say, 0 to pi, something else. Or you're going to have to change your vector valued function. So you're saying change the interval. That will work. Anyone else? Yes? 
Yes, that's, that, that, that's the way I, I, that first struck me as well. Is, is that what you're going to say? Yes. So, but what, this is one way of doing it, right? I'm not saying it's the best way, but it's just, it's just my way. Okay? From here. All right, now in that case, you can keep the same interval and just change your vector function. So this is something that students kind of see at first. It takes them a while to get. Some people see it quicker than others. But try to understand um, what's going on with these curves and how they're parameterized. That's, that, that's a huge advantage for later um, weeks in this course. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about, planes. Again, you've seen this in one, two, three, one, so I'm not going to concentrate too much about it. You can also parameterize two-dimensional things, like a surface. The plane here is a, is a two-dimensional thing. It's a surface, right? Now, in, all this lecture's been about one-dimensional things, curves, right? Curves are one-dimensional. But here, we're stepping up a bit and wanting to parameterize or describe a two-dimensional thing. So can anyone think, how many, how many variables or parameters will we need to, to describe a two-dimensional thing? We had one variable for one-dimensional curves. Anyone? Yeah, two. I need two. So for this um, case, we would form something like a vector involving two um, variables. So let's say P is a point. So again, using the triangle inequality, you can come up with um, the following. So that's what you want. There's their OP. Now, P naught's a point in the plane. You can always take a, or make a position vector from there. And then, if you've got two other vectors in the plane, you can form the following. So let's say, I don't know, you know use here and these here or something like that. Say T U plus S V. Okay, a linear combination of two vectors in the plane. Now you can, you know, form form the, the equation for planes using normal vectors. I'm not going to speak about that. Here's a whole bunch of stuff, but here is the vector form. Okay, two variables. Now, we're assuming here that the vectors in the plane are not parallel. So you can sort of, you know, they span the plane, I guess, in, in one sense. Now, we won't worry too much about planes in this section. We're more interested in curves. But this is sort of just the, the next step up. And you'll look at this when you do surface integrals. Right? You're going to be integrating over surfaces later in the semester. And it's important that you can parameterize surfaces. All right, guys, I'll see you all Thursday.